So that <clears throat> a little bit lays the groundwork for um, a few men that we'll speak of uh, during the uh, uh, era uh, here of the 1500s in, in Switzerland. There is, I got some pictures a, a little while after um, uh, Salome did that essay, I got some pictures uh, from a little uh, uh, museum in Schleitheim. I don't know if, Manuel, you've heard about that or been there or not. Small, I understand, museum about the little bit of the history of the Anabaptists there. Schleitheim, just right across from Zurich, right? Well, of course, over a huge mountain, but I mean, everything out there is like, you know, the mountain. Um, but uh, there's a little, little piece of history preserved um, uh, <coughs> there. Uh, uh, from this uh, from this time period. All right, so I'm going to pass another sheet here, and we're uh, going to take a minute um, or two or 15 and uh, look at one uh, of the uh, men mentioned today named Balthazar Hubmeyer. Got a picture uh, coming around uh, about him. And I want to give you an overview of his life, and then after that, we'll fill in as many blanks as we have time for. Uh, <clears throat> the, the, the big problem with Baptist history uh, that I have is uh, l limiting and picking which challenging and encouraging and inspiring people to talk about and how to limit my time talking about them. So I'm going to try to give you an overview that I, main things that I want you to have, and then after that, we'll take the remainder of our class period and, and, and fill in the gaps a little bit. As we mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, Balthazar uh, Hubmeyer um, was um, <coughs> uh, raised as a staunch Catholic. <coughs> and had a uh, tremendous uh, education as far as, as, far, as, uh, as, far as that goes. Uh, somewhere, uh, not sure exactly, somewhere about uh, 1480 he would have been born and uh, passed away, uh, we know that date, uh, 1528. <clears throat> I guess all of us wish we could live past the age of 48 and we're thinking about our life, we're not thinking about only living 48 years. Um, <clears throat> but um, he, he only lived 48 years, and uh, he was uh, martyred uh, for his belief, uh, stated belief, um, of, of, uh, of the Scripture and what the Scripture teaches, particularly with regard to baptism and the nature of the church. Um, <clears throat> Hubmeyer was raised Catholic. He was taught under Dr. John or Johann Eck. Johann Eck was the premier Catholic apologist of the day. Why? Because when Luther uh, needed uh, put in his place, the Pope sent Dr. Eck up there to do it. And Hubmeyer was his prize student. Uh, it is said that Eck praised uh, uh, Hubmeyer and his, um, and his uh, studies. <clears throat> At the age of 36, Hubmeyer was uh, given the position of pastor in the ancient cathedral in Regensburg. Regensburg, uh, <clears throat> Germany. There he becomes the pastor of this cathedral. So we're talking about someone here that has uh, a bright future as a very uh, uh, well-paid, well-taken-care-of Catholic priest. Influential, popular. Regensburg which, uh, was a city that... Uh, had a long-standing conflict with the Jews. And um, as the Catholic Church grew in power and influence there, uh, the result in that city 
was the expulsion of all the Jews and raising, not R-A-I-S-I-N-G, but R-A-Z-I-N-G, raising, which means uh, leveling, uh, their synagogue. A, a good picture into the mindset of the Catholic Church in uh, the 1500s with regard to Jews. Kind of a carryover from their same mindset that they had during the days of the Crusades. Anti-Semitic. To, uh, to say the least. And that's what Hubmeyer was in and was involved with. <clears throat> he um, eventually, <clears throat> after um, uh, some uh, series of miraculous supposed events took place in this chapel in Regensburg, uh, it began to get visited by pilgrims from around the around the uh, region to see these miracles that were taking place in this cathedral. And uh, so he uh, hosted these Catholic uh, miracle seekers at his church in Regensburg uh, there and uh, talked about the miracles that were taking place. After a little while, he made his way to another town a little bit further west and south. Um, and uh, the name of that town, and this is a town probably that he uh, spends uh, most time at, is uh, W-A-L-D-S-H-U-T, Waldshut, right along the Rhine River, at, at an, important, uh, an important part there of, of the Rhine River. <clears throat> and um, he preached there, 1521. He was loyal to his Catholic faith. The Reformation was two to three years old. He started to hear about it and uh, started to be challenged to study what it said according to the Bible. Somewhere, don't know exactly when or how it happened, but some point Hubmeyer got what these writings of the Reformers were saying and he got his Bible and he started to read and started to realize that he had been taught tradition, not Scripture. And he started to act on the truth of Scripture uh, that he saw. He began to make friends with those in the Reformation. He began to talk with the Swiss Reformers group that we talked about here a little bit earlier. These Swiss Reformers and Zwingli, leader of the Zurich City Council, began to discuss what the Bible said about baptism. And at that time, 1523, Hubmeyer said, Zwingli agreed with me that children should not be baptized before they are instructed in the faith. In other words, not infant baptism for sure. <clears throat> and um, Hubmeyer continued on. He declared the Bible must decide questions of church practice and polity, such as the Mass. I began to realize that the Mass um, was simply a traditional observance, but not something found in Scripture. He said this, Just as I cannot believe for another person, so I cannot hold a Mass for another person. Maybe you've been to uh, a, a Catholic funeral and seen the, uh, the, the cards that uh, Catholics will purchase for the deceased uh, that gives them 15 to 20 or 30 masses that the priest will say for them to help get them out of purgatory earlier. And uh, I was probably seven or eight and uh, when I saw that for the first time and I wondered what that little looked like a little, uh, a little like a coat tree, but it had these little clips on it. And people were going up with these cards and clipping it onto this kind of like a wire coat tree. And, and I asked somebody, and they said, well, look at it real close. And he looked at it, and it was a, somebody had purchased from the Catholic Church a card that said the Pope, or no, sorry, the Pope, uh, the priest is going to say this many Hail Marys for the one that's died. And this will help get them out of purgatory uh, quicker. 
and uh, these, these uh, things. Uh, Balthazar Hubmeyer said, this is not in Scripture. And uh, <clears throat> from his pulpit, he was getting praised because these people were getting taught Scripture. Can you imagine what that would be like to be in his congregation for the first time in uh, many, many years to hear preaching uh, in your own language, to hear what the Bible said uh, as absolute truth, to begin to hear a rejection of tradition? Can you imagine the change that that would take place and the, and the, uh, the difference that that would be like to the people that were the con in the congregation there? <clears throat> Catholics, of course, heard about this, and uh, Hubmeyer became targeted. They demanded that he be removed uh, from uh, his, his pastorate. Hubmeyer went further and uh, got married. That was, of course, a no-no for the Catholic uh, priest to get married, but he married a lady. Um, <clears throat> by the name of Elizabeth Hugeline, and uh, time, we'll see here by the end of this, that uh, she was at least as adamant, if not more adamant, in her beliefs than he was. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, <clears throat> Hubmeyer now uh, is facing tremendous opposition, and the opposition is not just from religious authorities, but it's from religious authorities that have the civil government to back them up. So um, uh, he and his friends, Conrad Grebel, Felix Manns, George Blaurock, began to um, battle it out. And I believe today is January the 15th, is that right? January 16th? 15th. January 17th, two days from now. January 17th, uh, 1525 was the well-known debate between Hubmeyer and Zwingli at the Zurich Council. You can go to Google Books and search, and you can find the transcripts <laughs> of that debate. You can hear and read their own words, and uh, you'll find um, Hubmeyer is... Uh, dealing with Scripture as his sole authority, and Zwingli is holding on, holding on to the infant baptism state church concept. That was the beginning of the end for the freedom of the Anabaptists or their, their um, ability to get their point across uh, somewhat in peace. Zwingli became their avowed enemy, and Hubmeyer was the champion of the Anabaptist cause. Grebel, Manns, Blaurock were summoned back to the council and warned to stop their teaching. <clears throat> Adult baptism was forbidden. Postponing infant baptism was forbidden under law. And in the city of Waldschut, the Austrian government, this is a little ways from Austria, but Austria, its uh, power and authority had reached into what it called its outlying lands. The Austrian government was securely Catholic, uh, began to uh, <clears throat> take, make preparations to send the armies here into Waldschut to, to stop this. Uh, movement. <clears throat> um, Hubmeyer, December 5th, 1525, escapes with just some tattered clothes to the city of Zurich. And at that city, he was demanded, commanded to make a public recantation of his, uh, of his uh, beliefs. And uh, <clears throat> when he began to refuse that, I'll pass this around. When he began, when he uh, refused that, um, the uh, Reformed City Council 
decided they were going to get this um, rebel to refuse to recant one way or the other. And so they <clears throat> applied to him the rack. They put him on the rack. The rack torture. The rack is commonly considered the most painful form of medieval torture. It was a wooden frame, usually above ground with two ropes fixed to the bottom and another two tied to a handle in the top. The torturer turned the handle, causing the ropes to pull the victim's arms. Eventually, the victim's bones were dislocated with a loud crack. If the torturer kept turning the handles, some of the limbs were actually torn apart, usually the arms. This method was mostly used to extract confessions, as not confessing meant the torturer could stretch some more. Sometimes, torturers force their victim to watch other people be tortured with this device to implant psychological fear. Many knights were tortured with the rack. The limbs collected from this and other punishments of the time were emptied by the hundreds. Sometimes this method was limited to dislocating a few bones, but the torture often went too far and rendered the legs or arms useless. In the late Middle Ages, new variations appeared. They often had spikes that penetrated the victim's back as the limbs were pulled apart. So was his spinal cord increasing, not only the physical pain, but the psychological one of being handicapped at best too. And they extracted a recantation from Hubmeyer after he got off the rack. And they drug him before the uh, city church in Zurich. And Zwingli preached on the, uh, the, uh, the need and the belief in infant baptism in the state church for a long time and then called Hubmeyer up to read his recantation. And he got up and with a quivering voice started to read what he'd said. And then halfway through that, he put down his paper. It's though he was uh, strengthened by God and shouted out, Infant baptism is not of God and men must be baptized by faith in Christ. And the cathedral went crazy. They dragged him out of the pulpit, threw the mass of people, and threw him back into his dungeon. In the dungeon, he rewrote his true confession of faith, which was belief in what the Bible taught. March 10, 1528, he was led forth to his death. His wife was along the route that he had to walk, and she uh, shouted out words of encouragement to her husband to stay strong to the Lord. While they were piling up the, the sticks in the woods, they stripped him of his clothing. The executioner took and rubbed sulfur and gunpowder into Hubmeyer's long beard. And uh, <clears throat> during this time, he was praying to God, asking for his own forgiveness, asking for uh, the forgiveness of his executioners. And uh, <clears throat> they ignited the wood. Soon his beard and hair, hair caught fire, and he cried out, Oh, Jesus! Jesus, suffocated from the smoke of the burning sulfur and gunpowder, he died. Three days later, they tied a large stone around the neck of his wife and took her down to the Danube River and threw her off of a bridge where she got her third baptism. And uh, the motto, as I think we heard the other day, the motto of Balthazar Hubmeyer that he wrote. He wrote extensively, and you can read uh, many things. You, he wrote extensively, but, but his motto that he put on everything that he wrote and that he preached was this uh, phrase, truth is immortal. He knew he was not going to be, but truth is immortal. And uh, almost, uh, almost 500 years later, uh, uh, we're talking about the exact same Bible truth that he stood for and gave his life for. All right, so we'll continue to look at uh, some different men uh, and movements from the Continental Baptist era of church history. And uh, be sure to have your questions brought back to class and answered with your chapter read for uh, Tuesday.